This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gido Yort. It's Thursday, June 10th. Welcome to Africa 54. We continue to work remotely because of the COVID-19 pandemic. But what hasn't changed is our commitment to bringing you the latest and most important news from the African continent and around the world. Here is today's Africa 54. Some 200 bodies are buried in shallow graves in and around the town of Hausen, Ethiopia, after more than seven months of war in the Tigray region. As VOA's Heather Murdoch reports from Hausen, Residents fear the fighting will continue and more people will be killed. Some mass graves in the Ethiopian town of Hausen hold dozens of bodies. Some hold only a few. Locals say there are about 20 graves in all, containing bodies that were found in the streets of the town after multiple battles. The most recent happened just a few weeks ago. <laughs> The bodies lay out on the ground for seven or eight days and there's no one to help us take them to the church. So a few of us buried them. They smelled bad, rotting and attracting maggots. Most housing residents have fled their homes, many to live in crowded camps without enough food. The town itself is in ruins. The families who remain say there is almost no way to make a living. Housing has changed hands about five times since the war began in November between the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front and Ethiopian and Eritrean forces. Ethiopian troops now control most of the region, including Housing. But fighting continues, and residents fear war could break out at any moment. There have been so many bombings in this town. Children have died, and houses are destroyed. In the market, few sellers make any money these days, the woman adds, but they sit there all day, hoping for luck. On the outskirts of Hausen, Lete Gurme says she doesn't expect much luck in this beleaguered town, as residents continue to bury civilians killed in war. She says among the dead are children and the elderly. <laughs> The killing continues. Recently, we buried another seven bodies near the church. This war has claimed thousands of lives and left millions of people displaced. Here in Hausen, some say they are no longer afraid because they cannot imagine anything worse could happen. Heather Murdoch, VOA News, Hausen, Ethiopia. The United States is providing more than $181 million to deliver food, water and aid to feed more than 3 million people it says are facing famine in the Tigray region of Ethiopia. The aid provided through the U.S. Agency for International Development is expected to provide enough food to feed 3 million people for nearly two months, as well as seeds, tools, and fertilizers to help farmers replant crops, according to a statement from the USAID. The agency says it is also providing safe spaces and psychological support for women and girls as well as case management for survivors of gender-based violence. Heavy flooding has washed away soil in an agricultural area of Ethiopia's Amhara state, but members of the community are fighting back with a simple solution. David Doyle explains. In the highlands of Ethiopia, Terefate Saga and dozens of other construction workers are loading rocks into wire cages. They're called gabions, and for farmers here, they could be a vital weapon against the effects of climate change. This work is about maintaining the gullies. First, we collect and prepare the stones. Then we dig into the ground, and then we put in the gabions. This is an area of Ethiopia's northern Amhara state that used to be covered in farms. But heavy flooding has washed away the soil, leaving farmers with less food to sell or feed to their families. The gullies are part of an irrigation system that directs the rainwater and trapped soil. The benefit of our work for this community is that we're helping to save the environment from soil erosion. 
and the youth from the community are getting employment and earning income to cover expenses. Terefe is employed by the Rural Poor Stimulus Facility. It was set up by the International Fund for Agricultural Development to support rural communities hit by the global health crisis. For Terefe, it's meant being able to help his community. But he says the money that he's earned has also changed his life, allowing him to buy sheep, chickens and clothes for his children. That was David Joy of Reuters reporting. In a recent interview with VOA, the U.S. ambassador to Nigeria, Mary Beth Leonard, spoke on a wide range of issues, including insecurity and ethnic violence. Our segment today covers Ambassador Leonard's perspective on how the U.S. views the agitation for independence for the state of Biafra, as well as demands by other groups. How is the U.S. viewing the current developments in Nigeria, the agitation for independent states of Biafra and also Afeni Ferry and many other groups. And I think uh, the message that I take from the experiences of, that the United States has had over the last year or so um, of it is in unity that we are able to confront the challenges that we share um, has applications here in Nigeria too. And I think in times like these, it's, it's time for people to uh, discuss their, their apprehensions about each other, their misperceptions about each other. Um, and we believe very firmly that conversations about equality of um, opportunity or equality of access to resources or of, of the elements of government is, is actually something that belongs in a, in a political realm uh, within constitutional processes. And uh, we hope that uh, Nigerians will move forward in that spirit. That was U.S. Ambassador to Nigeria, Mary Beth Leonard, speaking to VOA's Medina Dauda in Abuja, Nigeria. The Sudanese Finance Ministry has announced that the price of gasoline and diesel will rise as it enacts the International Monetary Fund monitored reforms aimed at turning around its economy. Neka Chile has the details. Sudan fully ended subsidies on gasoline and diesel on Tuesday, the finance ministry has said, in a move that has roughly doubled prices. The cash-trapped country has been implementing aggressive IMF monitored reforms. That's as it attempts to emerge from the economic decline on the ousted President Omar al-Bashir and attract debt to relieve and renewed financing. But the population has been burdened with the cost. Annual inflation climbed to 363% in April, and there have been shortages of bread, fuel, and medicines. The finance ministry said the price of gasoline will rise from 150 Sudanese pounds per litre, or around a third of a US dollar, to 290 pounds. Diesel will rise from 125 pounds to 285 pounds. Those prices, the ministry said, were in line with import costs. For subsidies cost Sudan $1 billion a year, and according to the authorities, benefited the middle and upper classes, rather than those with the lower incomes. Neka Chile of Reuters filed that report. A private game reserve in South Africa is collaborating on a project to rescue trafficked pangolins, a scaly mammal that is one of the most trafficked species in the world. Romaine Chanson has the story from the southeast province of KwaZulu Natal in this report narrated by Carol Gunsberg. Ecological monitor Charlie DeVos is trying to locate a pangolin. Okay. Holding an antenna, she is searching for a signal from a transmitter attached to the small scaly mammal. So she's right there for us. This female pangolin is hunting an ant colony. Last October, she had been hunted, found in a car trunk in a police operation that saved her from likely illegal export. Pangolins are coveted in East Asia for their meat and especially for their scales, which are used in traditional medicines. This particular pangolin seems to be in good health. So the sign for us of a healthy pangolin is that it's walking with its tail up and that it's not dragging the tail. It's also only walking on its two hind legs. You'll see it's only using the two front limbs for digging and finding the ants and termites. Pangolins seized by customs officials are treated at the Johannesburg Wildlife Veterinary Center, then sent to Finda, a private game reserve managed by luxury tour operator and beyond. No pangolins had been seen locally for more than 40 years before the project began in 2019. 
Before the FINDA project, four out of five rescued pangolins did not survive reintroduction, according to the Pangolin Working Group. So FINDA ecologists carefully supervise the animals after their release. Without human and veterinary intervention, pangolins that left the hospital in seemingly good health had underlying conditions because of the traumatic experience they had during the poaching. And if we, if we weren't monitoring them as intensively as we were, we wouldn't have been able to pick up these, these issues and those animals wouldn't have survived. Monitoring requires a transmitter and GPS beacon. 14 pangolins at Finda had been fitted with tracking equipment. Two died, but a baby or pup was born last December, perhaps the first birth in the wild since the pangolin had disappeared from the area. A pangolin approached uh, to make, the, to make a traditional medicine. I would love some other people, if they found any pangolin on the road or elsewhere, they can bring it to the, to the, to the right people. The Finda Reserve and its partners aim to release enough pangolins to have a population that can be sustained and shared with surrounding reserves. For Romaine Chanson in KwaZulu Natal Province, South Africa, Carol Gunsberg, VOA News. Leaders of the G7 group of industrialized nations are meeting in Britain this weekend with the COVID recovery, climate change, and taxation topping the agenda. As Henry Rijo reports from London, U.S. President Joe Biden can expect a warm welcome from European allies. British warships are patrolling the coastline of Cornwall, while 6,500 police officers have been deployed as Britain prepares to host the leaders of the United States, France, Germany, Italy, Japan and Canada. The G7 summit in Cornwall marks Joe Biden's first overseas trip as U.S. president. After four years of troubled transatlantic relations under former President Donald Trump, Biden will receive a warm welcome in Europe, says analyst Thomas Kleiner Brockhoff. The attempt to rebuild trust, lost trust with allies, is at the, at the heart of the agenda, and that message comes across loud and clear. The scars have not fully healed, according to Kleiner Brockhoff. There's a sort of a lingering suspicion that that Joe Biden could be an outlier, an intermezzo between two nationalist presidencies, an America that has changed for, for the long haul. Nonetheless, analysts say the G7 leaders will put on a strong show of unity amid numerous challenges. Creon Butler is a former British government advisor on the G7, now at Chatham House. The COVID recovery generally is the top item, and you can see that, you know, um, in the way that the UK is presenting the summit. Summit host Boris Johnson has pledged that the G7 will help to vaccinate the whole world by the end of 2022. Turning this rhetoric into reality is vital, says former British Prime Minister Gordon Brown. I think it's no exaggeration to say that Friday's G7 is a life and death matter. Its decisions will determine who is vaccinated and safe and who remains unvaccinated and at risk of dying. G7 leaders will also focus on tackling climate change. Trade and taxation, too, are high on the agenda. G7 finance ministers last week backed a plan for a minimum global tax rate of 15%. So this bit is really quite revolutionary, um, as indeed is the, you know, the agreement on... Um, sharing taxing rights around, uh, so not just in the, the location where the, the tax residence of the company is, but also in locations where a, co a, a company may have very large revenues but very, pay very little tax. The threat from Russia and China to G7 democracies will also be discussed in Cornwall. The question as to whether uh, Western countries can find a joint approach vis-a-vis -vis China and whether President Biden can get the language and the commitment that he needs for also his domestic political purposes out of its European allies to make it worthwhile, in their view, the investment that he makes into the European alliances. That, that to me, is the, the big question. Several of the G7 leaders will go straight from Britain to Brussels for a NATO summit next Monday. President Biden is due to meet European Union leaders Tuesday. Analysts say the sequence of meetings is aimed at underscoring allies' support ahead of Biden's summit with his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin, in Geneva next Wednesday. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, London.
The White House says U.S. President Joe Biden is planning to buy and donate 500 million doses of the Pfizer coronavirus vaccine to more than 90 countries. The announcement of the vaccine donation, the largest ever by a single country, comes as President Biden meets with leaders of the other group of seven advanced economies, Britain, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, and Japan, in Cornwall, England. U.S. drug maker Pfizer and its Germany, German partner, BioNTech, confirmed they will provide 200 million doses in 2021 and 300 million doses in the first half of 2022, which the United States will distribute to 92 lower income countries and the African Union. Coming up, a stern message to world leaders as Facebook bans former president Donald Trump. We'll be right back. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Linoch Mudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on VOA. Welcome back to Africa 54. Facebook's recent decision to ban former President Donald Trump for two years sends a message to world leaders that Facebook is stepping up its role as sheriff on its service. Tina Trin reports. They may allow me back. With Donald Trump suspended from Facebook for two years, experts say the social media company is sending a message to world leaders and public figures that Facebook will no longer give them preferential treatment when their speech breaks its rules. What it means for other world leaders is they're not just they're not going to be treated differently solely based on their status as world leaders. Along with Trump's suspension, Facebook rolled out a new policy saying it'll crack down on any world leaders' postings that could lead to harm or violations of its community standards. Previously, Facebook would leave content from public figures up, arguing that there was a public interest, even when that content violated its policies. Some critics say that the guidelines are still too vague and a two-year suspension of Trump too light and sends a message that the door to Facebook is always open, even for serious offenders. The fact that they're um, leaving this as a suspension means that the other world leaders are on pause too, a little bit, right? That means that maybe, just maybe, um, they may have an opportunity to continue. Facebook says public figures who eventually return will face increased penalties for repeat offenses, ranging from one month to two years. Only cases deemed extreme will result in permanent suspension. It doesn't matter who you are. You can be the Pope, the Queen of England, the President of the United States. You cannot use uh, our services, and I hope most people would think this is reasonable, to uh, aid, abet, foment, or praise acts of violence. While the company has set up an independent oversight board to review its content moderation decisions, some experts contend that the oversight board itself is a deflection. My sense is that they're using that as a way to deflect from more serious issues around you know what their algorithms are doing to spread certain kinds of information if the internet has come a long way in the last 25 years shouldn't internet regulations too over the past year facebook executives have called for government to play a larger role in determining the rules of the internet American democracy does not belong to Silicon Valley. It belongs to the American people. And the people who should set the rules for how American democracy plays out and where the line should be drawn on what speech is and is not acceptable shouldn't, exactly, shouldn't be private companies. While Facebook will look more critically at world leader speech, what's certain is that the scrutiny of Facebook itself won't let up anytime soon. Tina Trin, VOA News, New York. The ocean data that scientists need to understand climate change, marine life, and plate tectonics can be expensive and risky to gather. Matt Debo looks at a company that uses seafaring drones in place of research ships. This new vessel plying the waters of San Francisco Bay has no crew on board 
and is powered only by the wind and sun. It's being prepared for an important mission. The oceans cover over 70% of the world's surface, but they're really virtually unexplored. Less than 7% of the deep, deep ocean has been mapped. And that's what the Southern Surveyor is really designed to do. What it gives us is a three-dimensional, beautifully detailed picture of every topographical feature down there. Saildrone also has a fleet of smaller autonomous vessels that have successfully sailed the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans and circumnavigated Antarctica. They are packed with sensors to collect data related to weather, climate science, and marine life. Saildrone sells the data to government, scientific, and commercial organizations. It's really important to measure the oceans and to understand exactly what's going on so we can help not only predict the future, but possibly help change the future. Surveyor also has sensors, but its main mission is to map the deep ocean floor using sonar. Traditionally, research or mapping has been done by ships, very large ships like you see behind me, with a crew of 40 to 50 people on board, burning thousands of liters of diesel fuel per day. By harnessing the wind power, we can survey for months on end without coming back to port. I mean, it really removes the risk of putting humans in remote, dangerous places. The vessels are given a destination, but work out the details of navigation themselves using onboard artificial intelligence. For a thing to survive in the open ocean for 12 months by itself and set itself back really is a very, very tough challenge. Sail drone vessels are proving they can survive these missions and collect data vital to understanding our watery planet. Matt Dibble for VOA News, Alameda, California. Both President Joe Biden's $1.7 trillion infrastructure plan and a Republican counterproposal would invest in the country's inland waterways and ports. As viewers can Farabaugh reports, this aging pillar of U.S. infrastructure facilitates the efficient and environmentally friendly movement of U.S. goods to international markets. Like clockwork, towboats slowly push barges on the Illinois River, carrying everything from salt and petroleum to the top commodities produced in the state, corn and soybeans. This is the backbone of our economy. We feed the world from right here. Tom Heinold oversees the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers facilities along the Illinois River, including the Starbrock Lock and Dam near Utica. Part of a system throughout the state, the National Waterways Foundation says moves over 83 million tons of freight annually, worth over $13 billion. Using barges to transport goods on the rivers is efficient and environmentally friendly, reducing the need to use petroleum-guzzling trucks. Uh, we can take a thousand tractor-trailer trucks worth of commodities and put them on a single 15-barge tow. But the locks, which rise and fall to allow barges to navigate at a consistent depth of the river, were built nearly a century ago and are showing their age. It is literally in places crumbling. You can see the concrete right in front of you uh, deteriorating. On the vertical walls, you can see the, the corner armor rusting, uh, some of it's bent. Uh, it needs some help. They were built with a 50-year design life. Rodney Weinzerl is a farmer in central Illinois, where the waterways are key to getting crops to foreign buyers. He also serves as the executive director of the Illinois Corn Growers Association, which advocates for improving the country's inland waterway system. Exports are very important to Illinois and the U.S., and infrastructure is what keeps us competitive with uh, foreign competition. But Weinzerl says since most taxpayers rarely engage with this part of the country's infrastructure, the waterways often get overlooked. So the public just never really sees it. So it's much lower on the list of awareness uh, of infrastructure that's really helped make our nation what it is today. It needs some help to be reliable and safe. Uh, Previous funding allowed Heinold to oversee some upgrades to the Starbrock Lock and Dam in 2020, which closed the river to all traffic for several months. But Heinold says more work is needed up and down the system. And Weinzerl understands it isn't cheap. Each one of these projects are several hundred million dollars. Which is why he hopes enough money is allocated to perform upgrades to two locks along the Illinois River in the greatest need of repair. These are long-term investments. Heinold says he already has a list of what he would do with an infusion of funding. It's not that we have it spent before it gets here, but we, we know exactly what our capabilities are and where the funding needs to go. President Biden's infrastructure plan would dedicate $17 billion to improve waterways, ports, and airports. 
A Senate Republican counteroffer also proposes spending billions to upgrade waterways. Efforts to advance legislation both parties can support continues in Washington. Kane Fairbaugh, VOA News, Utica, Illinois. Some veteran Hollywood actors say a law intended to help gig economy workers has the unintended consequence of threatening nonprofit theaters. Mike O'Sullivan has the story from Los Angeles. Actor Edward James Olmos was among the performers who showed up at a recent event supporting live local theaters, such as this one in the Los Angeles immigrant neighborhood of Boyle Heights. The theater's founder, Mexico-born Josefina Lopez, wrote the play and co-wrote the screenplay for the 2002 film Real Women Have Curves, about the struggles of immigrant women. I've been in Hollywood for over 30 years, and it's been so hard to get Latino stories because they just want to do the narco stories. We're just the bad guys in a white man's story. And, um, and so I decided to, to open my own theater so that I could produce my plays. But small theaters' tiny budgets are being strained. These actors say many of those who work in the nonprofit venues are volunteers, but are included under a new state law that gives gig economy workers, such as Uber and Lyft drivers, a guaranteed minimum income. But there's no way we can do that. And if we have to treat every actor like an employee, maybe we can do one show a year and that's it. A bill making its way through the California legislature would offer a lifeline, say its proponents, by creating a state-administered payroll system and offering grants to small nonprofit performance groups. But critics object to an expanded arts bureaucracy. Some labor groups worry, too, that workers in nonprofit theaters face exploitation. But the bill has many supporters, including Hollywood veteran Edward James Olmos. I mean, it's like anything else. You have to have a training ground, and the kids deserve it. Success in show business usually comes after many years. Another Hollywood star, Danny Glover, recalls performing in a small theater with 10 people on stage and just five in the audience. But he says each performance is important. We're going to need all the heart, all the art we can, all the insight we can, all the story we can. Glover co-founded a small Los Angeles theater to highlight the black experience and says theaters like that need help. A Hollywood colleague agrees, saying small theaters teach people to appreciate each other. It's really important that we that we learn empathy, that we learn how to be with other people, that we learn to understand who they are and, and have them understand who we are so that we can keep this extraordinary thing called democracy intact. Mike O'Sullivan, VOA News, Los Angeles. That's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, we thank you for watching.